So welcome to Playing with the Unicorns, episode 12. This week, we're going to discuss the surprising keys for optimism in 2020 amidst pandemic, populism, and policy failure. So we're constantly being bombarded by negative news. Everywhere you look, it's something wrong going in with the world, from forest fires to social unrest, social injustice, high unemployment, pandemic, etc. And in the West today, the mood is morose and the perspective is dire. People have a sensation that perhaps your best days are behind us. And they have dystopian visions of, fu- of the future uh, that looks like so the world is ending. Now, if you take a step back, actually, um, factually, that's not really true. I mean, the history of humanity for the last 10,000 years until 1800 is actually one of stagnation, where people were working day and night to survive. But actually, the last 200 years especially have been rather exceptional. In the last 200 years, we've seen a 90% decrease in extreme poverty. A billion people came out of poverty alone in the last 40 years, especially in India and China. While almost no one lived in a democracy 200 years ago, now the majority of the population in the world lives in democracy. And life expectancy went from 29 uh, in 1820 to 72 today. In 1820, life expectancy was below 40 in every major country, in every single country in the world, actually, in addition to being 29 globally. And we've seen dramatic improvements in every country, including the emerging market. Now, whereas most people were illiterate, today uh, 86% of the population is literate at a world level. And while we worked 60, 70 hours a week to barely make ends meet 150 years ago, today we're in a position where we work less than 40 hours a week in the West to have a quality of life that was unimaginable to the kings of yesteryear, with everything from vacations to running, running water, electricity, cell phones, computers, the ability to travel, and, and things that were inconceivable to, to yes, the richest people of, of the past. But this is not a Panglossian view. This is not to say that all is for the best and the best of possible worlds. Quite the contrary. After COVID, we've reached the levels, um, or at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, we reached levels of unemployment not seen since the Great Depression. We still have tremendous issues of of race and gender inequality. Today, um, white American male makes 23% more than a white American female and 30% more than a black male. And even when you count for differences in education level, the, well, subsided, uh, these differences persist. We still have 12% of Americans living in poverty. And it's actually really expensive to be poor. Because you can't afford to buy wholesale in places like Costco, you're buying things in the local bodegas one by one, and you pay... 12, 20, 30% more. Same thing with housing. If you can't afford to have a security deposit and to pay your rent on a monthly basis, you pay more on a per night basis. Likewise, your the, the financial system charges you fees when your balances are low. And so it actually leads you to be underbanked. 25% of Americans are either unbanked or underbanked, which also shuts them out of wealth creation systems like the stock market. Moreover, because we've funded our public schools through local property taxes, it entrenches inequality. We're good neighborhoods of good schools and bad neighborhoods of bad schools. And it's resulting in having bad hospitals and and, and, and bad neighborhoods. And if you're poor because you cannot afford to live in the core cities, you're commuting one, one and a half hours per day, every day, in each direction, so two to three hours a day in reliable, uh, unreliable public transportation as we've underinvested in our general infrastructure. As a result, social mobility has fundamentally declined. It used to be a given that you were going to be better off than your parents. Today, this is only true for half of the people that are born. And part of the reason is almost all of the economic growth over the last 30 years has come from a few key cities that are doing really well, creating all the productivity growth, all the job growth. But these cities have passed these overly restrictive zoning laws. Essentially, in a place like San Francisco, you cannot build an apartment in 80% of the city. 
And as a result, in these types of cities, rents have increased over the last decade by over 70%. And it has made many of these cities unaffordable when you compare the level of income and income growth to the, to the level of rental growth. And as a result, whereas 40% of people used to move for, for new jobs, now it's down to 10%. Now, worse, even if you actually moved to a new city uh, to get a job, the jobs that are being created or only available, 90 plus percent of the jobs require a college degree, yet only... 36% of people that are 25 or above have a college degree, and it's 26% of the level of the population. And so most people are not, don't have the skills required for these new jobs. On top of that, climate change is a present, clear and present threat and uh, existential risk. So the level of heat accumulating in the oceans over the last 25 years is the equivalent of de detonating five Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs every second for 25 years. I mean, this is rather insane when you think about it. If aliens came in and started nuking us at five nukes a second, we'd drop everything to deal with it. But because it seems that we don't know how to deal with it or what to do about it, and maybe perhaps a natural cause, we haven't mobilized to face the issue. Likewise, we have a million species um, at risk of extinction because of climate change. And at the level of the current heating in the Arctic, it looks like we may not have any summer sea ice by September 2040, a mere 20 years from now. 20 of the last, or the most, or the 22 hottest years on record have happened um, in the last 22 years. And all that, because our policymakers have not addressed these issues, it has led to a rise of populists who have simple solutions that, that appeal to the masses. Now, of course, it's not as though these solutions are going to be viable or in, and populism ebbs and flows, and it's been flowing and perhaps it will be ebbing in the near future. But policymakers are not going to be solving these problems. There are structural issues that, that make it essentially impossible for politics to address a lot of these issues, especially things that require global coordination because of policy of the commons issues. But the good news, and that's what I want to present here today, is that as technologists, as entrepreneurs, as venture capitalists, we actually have the ability and frankly, the necessity of addressing these issues. So I'll break down the problem into the two underlying core components. Of it. I'd say the two fundamental issues of our times that we're going to be facing in the 21st century are climate change on the one hand and social injustice, economic inequality. And I want to talk about how we're going to be able to face these sort of problems with solutions and that it's already starting to happen. So if you look at climate change, the fundamental issue is greenhouse gas emissions. So almost all the issue comes from CO2 emissions and methane emissions, and they're split really with four core categories. But a quarter is electricity production, a quarter is um, agriculture and so food production, but 20% is industry and 14% is transportation. And we're making progress on all of these. So first of all, on electricity generation, as a society, we've constantly underestimated the decrease in costs in solar power. So if you take the very most optimistic cost projections from 2010, they actually massively underestimated the decrease in solar power and, and it cost per production per kilowatt per hour. So if you look at right now, solar is already by far the cheapest form of energy production at two cents per kilowatt per hour, which is cheaper than wind. It's cheaper than natural gas, coal, nuclear, and everything else. In fact, the first contract at 1.6 cents per kilowatt per hour was just signed in Saudi Arabia. And the good news is there is no end in sight. The, the, the cost is going to continue to decrease because it follows a slow kind of Moore's Law approach. And it varies every year in terms of how much improvements in productivity or decreases in cost we're seeing. But over the last 40 years, we've seen about 11% decrease per year, which basically means a decrease by a factor of 100 over the last 40 years. And as a result, despite, in a way, the U.S. moving out of the Paris Agreement, not making renewables a, a priority, the majority of the new electric capacity added in the U.S. over the last decade has actually been from renewable and most of that from solar. Now, the issue is not energy production from 
solar, it's already the cheapest form. The issue is that it's not always, the sun is not always bright and the wind is not always blowing. And so the issue is storage. Today, storage is rather expensive. It's about a 60 cents per kilowatt per hour and makes the renewable energy not viable in terms of fully loaded cost comparison with, with alternatives. But even here, there's great news. So lithium-ion battery costs have decreased by 85% in costs in the last decade. And we're seeing a lot of improvements in the, in the labs with both V-flow batteries, graphene batteries, and frankly, different types of mixes that, that lead us to suggest that we will be seeing a continue, continued decline, perhaps and hopefully by another factor of 10 in the coming decade of storage. In addition to that, different companies are taking very innovative approaches for to attack and address this problem. So Energy Vault is using gravity to solve the problem. It's a Swiss-based company uh, created by the founder of Idea Lab, Bill Gross. And what, what he's doing is using solar panels during the day to bring up these massive cubes of cement to build basically this pyramid during the day. And at night, they use gravity as the cement blocks that are heavier going down to actually generate electricity. And early estimates suggest that perhaps at scale, this could store energy for as little as three cents per kilo kilowatt per hour. If that were to be true, the two cents of energy production with three cents of storage, we'd actually have a viable solution that would be a proper replacement for coal, natural gas, nuclear, et cetera. Now, solar is also leading to fundamental improvements in other categories. So we're now seeing with things like heliogen, the ability to create and manufacture cement, steel, and a lot of things that in the past required carbon in a carbon-free way because you're creating enough heat that you can actually manufacture it. And that attacks the 21% of carbon emissions coming out of, uh, of, of manufacturing and industry in general. At the same time, you have really cool new innovations like zero mass water, which was actually recently renamed, where basically these are hydroponic solar panels which grab water from the air and, and humidity from the air and transforms it in drinking water. And it's commonly used in places like in, in refugee camps as a means of, of fresh water. And what's really cool is it works even in places where there's very little humidity, so like in deserts, as a, and, and, and gives you a basically unlimited source of fresh water. Now, in terms of food, um, there's also progress being made. Now, in a way, this one is in the, it's early or in the near term going in the wrong direction. As people are becoming wealthier, they're, com they're consuming more meat, and both cows and sheep are belching essentially large amounts of methane. Um, that said, we're seeing an early trend, first of all, of plant-based foods, which are becoming more common, even though they're not particularly healthy as they're highly processed. And it's going to lead to ultimately the emergence of things of lab-grown meat. Now, lab-grown meat is really cool because all of a sudden you have an animal protein that has the exact same taste, nutritional value as a meat that comes from the cow, uh, except no animal was hurt in, in, in the making of the food, and it uses 99% less water, less land, doesn't lead to any methane emissions. Um, that said, we're about a decade away, right? Humans in general can be counted on doing the right thing when it's in their economic interest. Today, you know, the meatballs that were lab grown cost a lot of money and don't taste particularly good. But imagine with the continuation of Moore's Law, or at least a slow Moore's Law in this category, we can go from a world where, where you, can go to, you can imagine a world where maybe in a decade you get a filet mignon that's lab-grown, that tastes better than the best filet mignon you've ever had, that also will not have hurt any animals. And by the way, the way we treat animals in our mass farming system is probably uncomfortable, and people in the future will look at us as ethically challenged, uh, probably look at us the same way we look at the gladiator fights uh, back in the day in the Roman Empire. Um, and so no animals will have been hurt. And But people only do it once it's less expensive, or at least the same price as the alternative. Now, the reason it's bound to happen is cow productivity is improving by 0.01% per year. It's driven, obviously, by natural selection and whatever we can do. But we've already driven it so far through antibiotics and, and mass reduction and natural selection. It's not improving very much anymore. And in fact, if perhaps there is a trend towards wanting to have more organic food and grass-fed beef rather than mass manufacturing. Uh, whereas in this case, lab-grown meat is improving productivity dramatically every year. Now, it's probably a decade away. Now, in the meantime, 
to get us there and to solve the issues, we're investing in companies like Mutrol. So Mutrol is really, really cool. They provide a, a feed, an animal feed supplement that decreases methane emissions from animals by a third. And they're giving it away for free to the ma- mass, the large agro companies because they're getting paid through carbon credits. And, and so something like that can perhaps stench the gap until we get to the point where we have live grown meat and to try to limit the increase in, in uh, methane emissions that will come as more people start consuming meat. In uh, transport, which is 14% of emissions, we're already making a fair amount of strides led by Tesla. But frankly, every major manufacturer is currently moving to bringing or being fully electric within 10 to 20 years. And so it's, it's, it's already moving along uh, in a way that we can see the end of transport being a, a source of major emissions. Now, for travel or air travel, which is about 2% of the emissions, even here we're making or seeing progress. We, we've invested in Archer, which is an electric uh, vertical takeoff company. And we're even seeing companies like Wright developing things like electric short, I guess, small short distance jets and uh, to address the fact that air travel, at least until the pandemic, was becoming more common and was increasing as a source of emissions, though from a rather low base. So even here, I'm rather optimistic. Now, all that said, it's not enough. So even if we stop producing and emitting new emissions, we actually need to start taking a lot of the emissions that we put in the atmosphere in the last two centuries. And there are a number of initiatives going underway to do that. One of the um, non-for-profit initiatives, which is rather promising, is the Trillion Trees Initiatives. It suggests that for $4 billion per year, you can plant 60 billion trees. So for $80 billion, you can plant over a trillion trees over the next 20 years, building a massive carbon sink. Likewise, we have a number of companies uh, in the market that are actually working at extracting carbon directly from the atmosphere, companies like Carbon Engineering and Carbon Capture. So all that to say that, frankly, even without government intervention, without even any subsidies, we're definitely heading to a world where we're going to completely remove carbon from our general economy and energy production system. Uh, most people will say within, by the end of the century, I suspect it will happen within 20 years, perhaps 30 years, where the vast majority of, because all the new capacity that will be added will be renewable. And so by 2040, 2050, essentially we, all the energy production and then all the consumption downstream will be carbon free. And it could happen even faster than that. This is assuming just the continued improvement in solar, but we're seeing massive improvements finally in in fusion, and especially in the private sector fusion investments that are very promising. It used to be, or there was this joke that fusion was the technology that was 50 years away and will always remain 50 years away, but we're finally seeing progress. And so it could actually bring about at least the full decarbonification of our electricity production earlier should any of these actually pan out. Jury's still out. It'll happen anyway, even if that doesn't play. And something really interesting happens in a world where all of a sudden, essentially, energy becomes too cheap to meter. Because solar keeps becoming cheaper every year, because perhaps fusion will create a world where the marginal cost of electricity is going to zero, once you have energy that's too cheap to meter, there's a lot of things that you can do to with, with it that it today would be deemed wasteful, but ultimately will become common, right? So many people are worried, for instance, that we have a, a water crisis. They're like, well, we don't have enough fresh water. But in a way, it's not an issue of, of abundance. Water is 70% of, of the earth. It is highly abundant. The issue is that salt water. But if you have infinite electricity, you can actually desalinate it. Likewise, people are worried about food shortages. But again, we have a lot of land that we're not using. It's just a lot of it is not arable. So you're not growing crops in the desert. But if you have, again, infinite electricity that allows you to create infinite fresh water, you can grow crops in the desert. You can create vertical farms. And so it actually solves a whole bunch of other issues. And so I'm very, very optimistic that in this century, we will face the climate threat uh, that we're facing today that for many feels like there is no optimistic solution because our governments can't get their acts together, but it will be done because that, frankly, there's a trillion dollar opportunity there and we're for pursuing that opportunity. Likewise, while we have made progress on social and racial injustice and, and inequality, uh, there's a still a lot to go. 
And that's where I think the marketplaces that I love to invest in come to play. Entrepreneurs basically see these low user or bad user experiences as an opportunity or things where things are extremely expensive. So going category by category, you know, a company like Rhino, for instance, will replace the security deposit, giving access to people who can't necessarily afford a security deposit to have a long-term, a, a, a long-term lease. Um, or Neighborly tries to change the way that the landlords evaluate the viability of their potential tenants. So instead of using credit scores, which are somewhat of a, um, I don't know if it's archaic, but definitely limited tool, they actually look at people's social behavior to see, are they going to, are they going to be good payers and good tenants? Likewise, in, in, in housing, in order, because I don't think we can solve the problem of restrictive zoning laws. You know, there's a level of nimbyism that, that is hard to change, especially since it's local policy. So I don't think you can just come in and say, okay, let, let's build and let's have infinite buildings. I mean, I'm not saying building over parks, obviously. I'm just saying build up in places that are limiting the real estate. But what we could do is do things like co-living, where you're creating very small spaces such that your monthly rent is, is low while you have still great common areas in, 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 um, for people to live in. And as a result, creating more access to the cities that are the creators of, job, of jobs. And we have companies like Ali and Common going in that direction. Likewise, in financing or in finance, and, and finance probably has been one of the areas that's been the most broken. If you look at the user experiences that people had, interacting with your insurance company, with your credit card company, with your bank has been one of the most displeasing, one of the most dif difficult uh, to, to, to get to. If you try applying for a mortgage, the amount of information they require and paperwork and time is horrible. But there's a new wave coming of neobanks all around the world, things like Revolut or Chime, where basically in minutes with no fees, no minimums, you can create a bank account and giving access to all the unbanked, um, much greater access to the unbanked. And we're seeing it even in the emerging markets. In Argentina, there's a company called Walla giving access for the first time to millions of people that have been unbanked. Likewise, Robinhood is allowing people to have access to the stock market. Um, again, no fees, no commission, making it much easier to provide access and decrease the number of people that are unbanked in the world. In food, we're seeing a major revolution as well. Today, especially if you're poor, you, you, you don't really have a choice, but allocate a large percentage of your time to buy, going grocery shopping, buying food, making food, et cetera. It can be a very pleasant experience and you may love it, but it, the opportunity cost of your time is not really counted in that. And very few people in a way are ordering food online. Today, less than 10% of all food is ordered online. And there are multiple reasons and good reasons for that. Today, only in a way fast food is available um, where it's Chinese food and Thai food and pizza and burgers. So it's not particularly healthy. And at the same time, it's actually rather expensive. You need to pay for delivery. You need to pay for, uh, yeah, delivery fees are high. And, and it takes 30 minutes, 40 minutes to get to you. Often it's cold. It's not particularly good. But there are mega trends here that are changing that profoundly. With the advent of dark kitchens, we're now seeing restaurants that can create, or virtual restaurants that can create food for much cheaper because they no longer have venues, they no longer have to pay for the metro D and the waiters, et cetera. So your meal can, can, be, can be a lot cheaper because their underlying cost structure is a lot cheaper. At the same time, we're seeing automation that is both decreasing labor costs and actually improving efficacy and time to creation. More investors are a company called Mealco, where the average time between an order and the meal being prepared is three minutes because of automation, because they're using dark kitchens. And with autonomy and with, uh, and it could be drones or probably not self-driving cars per se, but vehicles for delivering food. And with density, delivery costs are going to be a trend to zero. So imagine a world 10 years down the line where you can get any type of food with any, for any type of requirement you might have, you know, paleo, keto, gluten-free, nut-free, et cetera, that is very high quality, organic if you wanted to, as healthy as you want it to be, that is cheaper than any other form of food available, including making it for yourself, delivered to you in 15 to 20 minutes for free. Well, in that world, I posit that at least 25%, perhaps 50% of all food made will be ordered online. And especially for those who don't necessarily have the time to go and actually make these meals, it'll be a revolution. Perhaps cooking will become a luxury in a way where you can show that you're, you can afford to, to, to do it. 
That's not to say that restaurants will disappear. Not at all in the sense we are social beings and the social value that comes from restaurants will continue to exist, nor is it to say people will stop cooking. It'll be an amazing time to bring people together and some an activity that many people will enjoy. But food delivery will go from what is basically a novelty and sub 10% of all food ordered to perhaps the norm. Likewise in work, humans have been doing jobs, frankly, that they were not meant to be doing. We, we've because of the modern economy, we've created these levels of hyper-specialization where people are doing repetitive, mind-numbing jobs. And a lot of these have, are becoming automated. And, and, and actually, that's a good thing. I don't have these Malthusian fears that rope automation is destroying jobs. And if you take a step back, if I take you back to 1998, 22 years ago, and I told you, look, in uh, 2019, and we'll use it in a year not being, uh, that's not being disrupted by uh, a, a major event like COVID. By 2019, the four top job categories of 1998 will have disappeared. There'll be no more travel agents. There'll be no more bank tellers. Almost all of car production will have been robotized and automated. And by the way, 500 billion of retail will have gone from online from offline to online destroying local commerce please imagine or tell me the macroeconomic situation and the unemployment rate in 19, in 2019 most people have said oh my god it's the end of the world the great depression 25 percent level of unemployment and in fact we had the lowest level of unemployment that we'd had in 50 or 60 years more jobs have been created than ever before and we were actually finally seeing uh income uh, per capita increase across the board and actually uh, in, in the blue collar jobs faster than the white collar jobs for the first time in a long time. And there are multi many reasons for that, but it's, it's very easy to imagine the jobs that are going to be automated and the destruction that happens. It's actually very hard to imagine the jobs that are going to be created and are going to replace that. And you know, 1998, it was impossible to imagine that we'd have things like Twitch streamers and Instagram celebrities, social media managers, and a whole slew of jobs. Again, it's not to say that jobs are not destroyed. They absolutely are. And the people that get new jobs are not necessarily the same ones as the ones that lose jobs. But that leads to what the future of work, I think, is going to be. And it's one where you do the job that you love to do and nothing else. There's this massive trend right now in the passion economy. So imagine, for instance, that in today's world, you're a freelance software developer. The amount of work you need to do is actually rather, it's not just programming. You need to find a client. You need to invoice them. You need to be interviewed. It's a lot of work. If you're a photographer, same thing. You're spending a lot of your time doing things that are not related to the job you'd like to do. So we're investors in a company like Miro, where basically a company says, I need a photographer. Miro picks the photographer. And then that said, the photographer just needs to go and take photos. Everything else, invoicing, post-processing, editing, retouching is done for by the company. And so in the future, you will probably have, or you'll be in a position to only do the job you love doing rather than having to do everything else. This will also be true at the company level. So companies are going to outsource a lot of things they don't, they don't, that are not core to their business. And they're going to focus on the things that are best for them. And, and so their core value proposition, they're going to own and everything else they're going to outsource. And then that's leading to a trend of many of these B2B SaaS companies emerging because software companies consume in a way other software. And that's why you have like Stripe for payments or Shopify for, for hosting your online store or Slack or Zoom or, you know, Affinity for CRM and, and countless others. And it, let me give you another example of, uh, of how I see the future of work. You know, imagine you're Luigi. Uh, you own a local mom and pop pizzeria. You got in the business because you want to cook pizza. You want to interact with your customers. Yet, as a small business owner, you end up spending all of your time doing accounting, picking up the phone, creating a website, answering comments on TripAdvisor or Yelp. It's not what you signed up for, and yet it's the mass, the majority of your time. So, we're investors of a company called Slice. Slice is a pizza food delivery application. But the nuance within Uber Eats or Seamless Grubhub is that the way they, they got into the business is by doing essentially all of the back office operations for the Luigi's of the world. They pick up the phone for them. They help with the marketing, the packaging, creating the website, answering the comments. This way, the pizza owner can actually just go to what he loves doing. And that mega trend is going to continue and frankly create a world where people are gonna have the job they wanna be doing. 
And and it you can really see that in the passion economy where you have new, new companies from like, I mean, Twitch, Cameo, uh, but frankly, many others where people create classes, et cetera. I mean, think think of um, think of Teachable, where you can create your own classes and people can can sign up for it. Likewise, because now the new trend, especially in marketplaces, is one where the marketplace picks your supplier, it helps eliminate a lot of cognitive biases. Now, that's not to say that there cannot be implied bias in the way the in, in the way the applications pick the supply. But it, a, they can be fixed, and B, they're a lot they're implicit as opposed to explicit. Imagine you were an African American uh, man in New York trying to get a cab. 20 years ago, no cab would ever take you. You know, an Uber, that's not the case because Uber is optimizing for who is the, the, the driver closest to you rather than other variables like race, et cetera. And that's true, frankly, of almost all of the uh, marketplaces that we're seeing today that where you say whatever service you need, you need a plumber, you need, you need a marketing person, you need, a, you need a dump truck driver. It's all driven by who is the best person for you and, and it allows to limit these types of biases. At the same time, we're slightly, finally starting to see shifts in the three main components of GDP that in a way had been resistant to change. You know, telecine, telemedicine is finally coming to the forefront. We came from a world where essentially less than 1% of the population had had an online consultation, where often, frankly, it was illegal. The HIPAA requirements meant that you were not allowed to, to actually uh, have remote conversations with your doctor on like Zoom, et cetera. But all that changed during the pandemic. Now 25% uh, of, of the population has actually had a remote uh, medicine appointment. And what's interesting is based on the early evidence, it's cheaper, waiting times are lower. It actually increases adherence. So you have less recidivism and it leads to fewer return to hospital visits. So you have a better general user experience and better outcomes. And we're seeing companies like Amwell or Talkspace, you know, already getting millions of clients um, with online, with online, for online medicine. Likewise, education, which is about 6% of GDP, whereas uh, I guess healthcare in the US is like 17.6% of GDP, had not really seen much change. If I teleported Socrates from 2,500 years ago to today, there's very little about the world you would recognize. We, we have these magical devices where we have all the information and the knowledge of humanity in our pocket. We can do these free video calls. We can fly to what, from one end of the world to the other. I mean, it, most of the things you would see would look like magic. One of the few things that you would recognize, though, is the way we educate our kids. Basically, like 2,500 years ago, we have a teacher of variable quality spewing facts out to a class of, again, variable quality. And when you think of what the future of education should look like, that makes no sense. And there's great news here, too. We're seeing, frankly, for every type of class, massive types of, of innovation. A lot of it free, by the way. I mean, Khan Academy is providing amazing free curriculum for K-12. through And Coursera, to the extent you don't need... Um, the accreditation, which most people don't, you have the very best teachers around the world teaching, teaching, uh, frankly, every top college level topic that you can imagine. Plus, you have like tutoring, you're seeing like skills types companies, and you're even seeing, seeing new business models around training and retraining to the extent people cannot afford schooling with things like income sharing agreements with, with schools like Lambda. And public services, which probably has been the most resistant to change. I mean, if anything, if you think of government over the last 100 years, it's been one of negative productivity, where the government has an ever-increasing share of GDP, and yet lower outcome, low NPS, and, and, and lower productivity. And countries like Estonia are leading the way. In Estonia, 99% of public services are online. 90% of people pay their parking ticket online. People pay their taxes online in three minutes. And 47% of people voted in the last elections online. And 99% of prescriptions are given online. And for the first time because of COVID, we're seeing change. I mean, Europe for a long time, if you wanted to sign a document, you needed a notary. You needed, uh, you needed an apostille. Things that made no sense. They didn't even accept electronic signatures in countries like Spain or France or Germany. And for the first time, they're now accepting online electronic signatures. And COVID has 
is starting to move all the governments, which go from literally 30% to 57% of, in France of GDP online, improving productivity, improving user experiences for the first time. And the great news is we're just at the beginning. We're just at the beginning of the tech revolution. We're just at the beginning of the improvements that are going to come. And there are many categories that I've even touched upon. I mean, we have, we're seeing we're in the eve or, or verge of a transition to self-driving and autonomy that will bring the marginal costs of delivery to zero, which will have profound secondary effects. We're seeing massive improvements in 3D printing, in robotics, in augmented rea reality, in drones, in nanosatellites, in, in, nano, in nanotech in general, and frankly, even in mind reading, where today you can go to um, a lab and put a headset on your head and um, think a thought and have it appear on a screen now. It's still low resolution, but it, it it portrays or makes you believe if, if in a future where perhaps you, you know you, that little interaction you have with your phone will disappear. You're going to have the equivalent of augmented telepathy, I mean, probably 10, 15, 20 years down the line, but you can actually see the, that future being created. So all that to say that all of us here are extraordinarily privileged. We're, we're privileged to be in a position to bring about a better world of tomorrow, a world of equality of opportunity, of plenty, that is socially conscious and environmentally sustainable. Thank you. So with that, take a little break and see uh, if anyone has questions. Let's see, and uh, da da da. terms of education, what about neurodiverse students? What about, so in terms of education, what's really rather interesting is, um, yes, absolutely. P people have different abilities. People have different, everything from attention spans to IQ, et cetera. And my concern, frankly, with the current educational system is it serves the average, right? If you're an extraordinary student in a class, you're going to be bored. And if you're the worst student in the class or the one with low, low, lowest attention span or lower IQ, you're going to be out of your depth. And teachers, as spewers of facts, are not playing the role that, that I expect the future teachers will be doing. As I suspect in the future, the class will be taught by your software that's actually at your level with a, a personalized class. And the teacher, in a way, will be your coach. If there's something you're not understanding, they will come and help you. They and, and that level of personalized education will be way more uh, ap appropriate for everyone at every level, regardless of IQ, regardless of attention span, regardless of, of, of frankly, socioeconomic background, and everyone will have the education that's right for them. Now, it'll take a long time to transfer our monolithic public education systems to these new solutions, but it's moving in that direction, and we're seeing the early beginnings of it today. Let me see if, uh, let's wait a few more minutes, see if anyone has, else has questions, and um, if not, I'll end it. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about SPACs, the world of SPACs, what, uh, what they are, how they work, uh, why they've been so frothy and bubbly of late. Um, and we'll be joined by um, uh, FJ Labs Venture Boy, uh, Jeff Weinstein, who presented the business of venture capital. Let me think through if there's anything that I didn't cover or touch upon um, that, that I think is worth mentioning um, briefly. Mm -hmm. I think uh, made a reasonably uh, uh, compelling case for this. Anyway, uh, if anyone has questions, leave them in the comments. I'd be more than delighted to, to answer. If anyone has ideas for topics that they want me to cover in the, in the coming weeks, I'd be uh, delighted uh, to do that. And if not, you know, have a great weekend. And uh, I'll see you guys next week to discuss and talk about everything um, about SPACs. Bye, guys.